Okay, fifth graders, welcome back to another excerpt from Nowhere Boy. I'm going to read chapter 23 today, and I'm just going to read one chapter. And the reason I'm doing that is because it is a very powerful, emotional chapter. We're going to learn today what happened to Ahmed's family, his two sisters, his mother, his grandfather, when they were in Syria. And it's very emotional. It's very tough read. I almost considered not... Um, like not reading it. And I thought, I kept thinking to myself, Mrs. B, why did you choose this book? Um, but it is an important story and it is what's going on now. Um, and it brings up a lot of themes that are even happening in this country. So when we left off um, last week, Max and Ahmed, they're, they're searching for the terrorists because they believe that the terrorists that perpetrated the crime in France were from Belgium. So they're searching door to door for the terrorists and they stopped um, a refugee and they were asking for his papers and he was very nervous. And he said, please, I, I, I do have my identity card, but I have to move my hands. And he was, he was very afraid. And I think we can make parallels to, um, the relationship between African Americans and the police here um, in the United States as well. So um, they're getting they're if they're Arab looking, they're getting stopped. Um, whether there's a reason or not, just because of who they are, and that that is racism. It's it's wrong. Um, so there's no schools. School is closed, churches are closed, the subway is closed, scouts is closed, or scoots as they call it. Um, so they're in lockdown, similar to what we're in, just for a different reason. Um, but they were reading the story about the, um, the Confederate soldier who went into battle and bravely went up the slope against Union fire. And I was wondering why the author might have put that story in. Um, and Max is afraid to ask him about his family because he's afraid it's going to open up a wound and what's under there because it's it can't be a good story. And Max is finally ready to tell, um, I'm sorry, Ahmed is finally ready to tell Max what happened to his family. So here we go. So this is a tough read, guys. It's, a, it's emotional and it's really, really sad. So sorry about that. Chapter 23. I'll do, uh, first, let me just read a little bit of where we left off so you know. Um, Ahmed had started reading Chapter 3 of Boy Heroes about Edward Jameson, a 16-year-old Confederate soldier who fought in the Battle of Malvern Hill. It wasn't one of the most, one of the more uplifting stories, but Max felt there was something dishonest about skipping it. He listened to Ahmed read how Edwin had charged bravely up a slope and directly into Union fire. But every time Max was about to interrupt and ask Ahmed about himself, he hesitated. He felt the same way he did before throwing a pebble into a pond, half afraid to disturb what was beneath the surface. When Ahmed reached the part of the chapter where Edwin was killed by the direct hit of a cannonball, he stopped reading to look at Edwin's photo. Max had always thought it was the best of all the boy heroes. The image clear, Edwin staring straight into the camera, his eyes wide and gentle. Ahmed opened his mouth. No sound came out, but his eyes looked at Max like Edwin Jameson's, like they wanted to speak. What is it? Max asked. Ahmed blinked and turned away from him toward the orchids. Cannonball is like bomb. The people hit straight at feel no pain. So let's see what that means. Chapter 23. That was what his father had told him. And for nearly a year now, Ahmed had pretended to believe it. Who are you talking about? Max asked gently. Ahmed turned to Max. It was too late to keep his mouth shut, to lock the story back up inside him. A part of him no longer even wanted to. We live in Aleppo, he began. You know Aleppo? Max shook his head. Biggest city in Syria, very old. Home of Yami, Halab, Akhabar, very famous old mosque, which is like a temple. 
Also, most big market bazaar, most big market bazaar in in the world. These were familiar tourist places. He was certain that at least pictures remained of the vast tiled courtyard of the great mosque, and its thousand-year-old minaret, and the Al Medina Souk. 13 kilometers of covered shops selling everything from bolts of silk to nuts. That's the big market. What seemed even more lost was something that he couldn't have captured even if he knew the English words. The ordinary rhythms of life that make a place and a time feel like home. There were only flashes of memory, almost unreal now. The smell of jasmine as he walked to school, cheering the Red Castle, the city's champion football team, the pomegranate tree by the playground, pigeons perched on its branches, helping his grandfather prune the roses and water the pear and loquat trees at his nursery. Ramadan nights after the long tarawi prayer, playing with his sisters and eating date-filled maruk sweetbread, his father taking him through the twisting cobblestone alleys of the old city, to listen to Sufi musicians chant the haunting ancient poetry of Aleppo. Why did you teach me to love, then leave me when my heart became attached to you? That's a line from the poetry. When war start, it's summer. I am 11 years old. Rebels who want end to Syrian president Bashar al-Assad take over eastern part of Aleppo and the government army tries to take it back. One morning, all calm. The next, there is bomb, one straight from our street. Ahmed still remembered that day, how Baba had ordered Ahmed and the rest of his family away from the window, then rushed outside. But Ahmed had found a way to peer out in the direction of the explosion. A cloud of gray, chalky dust hovered in the air where his friend Hassan's apartment building had been. Ahmed could hear cries and shouts as his father and other neighbors, neighbors scrambled atop what remained of the building, tearing with bare hands through the rubble. So his best friend's apartment building was destroyed by the bomb. It still hadn't seemed possible though that the building was gone, that there was air where there should have been wall, that his son, whom he had seen earlier that morning, carrying home a stack of bread might be gone too. The sun was still shining, the summer air still scented with coffee. A motorcycle engine roared and Farouz, the popular Lebanese singer, blared from radio in the distance. Ahmed's eyes settled on a familiar orange tree in his neighbor's garden. It was the same as ever, spindly and yet sagging with fruit. And for a split second, Ahmed felt reassured that life was still this and not that. The empty space of the missing building, like a punched out tooth, then he noticed eyes staring back at him. Among the branches of the orange tree, a rebel soldier was crouching with a gun. I can't imagine it, fifth graders. I just can't imagine it. In days after this, more bomb, more gunfire. Many people leave, take all they can in car, bus, on motorbike. So there is no, en no enough petrol. We stay at school of my father. Wait, so um, they didn't have enough gas to leave. Ahmed wished he could describe the exodus. Mattresses, carpets, children, and old people crammed together in the flatbeds of pickup trucks. Whole families teetering on a single motorcycle like some desperate circus act. Even people on foot carrying children and overstuffed sacks on their backs. Even without petrol, Ahmed's family could have left that way. But the school seemed safe, and his father feared that the refugee camps forming outside the city might be targets too. So they had waited several days till the bombs seemed less frequent and the artillery fire more distant. A few days later, it is quiet. We go home. Many buildings fallen on ground, shops closed, few car on road, but our home is there. Ahmed was certain Max could never understand the relief they had all felt to see it still standing. It was only when they had stumbled inside, tears brimming in his mother's eyes, the girls almost giddy, that they realized that the TV, his father's desktop computer, the table, and every single one of the chairs were gone, looted mostly, 
most likely by rebels. So they took, they took um, what was there. They took their belongings. A foul smell drifted from the kitchen. The food in the fridge had rotted after the power went out. At nearly the same time, his sister Jasmine shouted that the toilet wouldn't flush. Many problems though, no water, electric, phone, Ahmed explained to Max. Mother, father, get ready to leave. They pack photos, documents, clothes, but there is no bomb that night and everyone is tired. You could see why they would decide to stay because it's calm again and they're tired. They were awakened the next morning just before dawn by the call to prayer. As the sun rose, the neighborhood came creeping back. A few merchants, carts, a handful of neighbors inspecting the sandbags piled up at an intersection. The electricity flickered on, a radio blared, a baby cried. That was how it began, the illusion that life could be normal again. So there were some things that were happening that were like, okay, we got the electricity back. These are familiar noises in life in the city. So maybe we're going back to normal. As his parents and sisters sat on the floor and quietly ate stale bread and fig jam, Ahmed could tell that none of them wanted to leave. When the rat-a-tat-tat of gunfire echoed through the air, they froze mid-bite. An eerie silence fell outside as if they were all birds and a cat was passing. But as soon as the gunfire stopped, the sounds and voices returned and Ahmed and his family went back to eating. Father feel bad to leave his students, Ahmed explained. We decide not to go. They never made an actual decision to stay though. An emergency bag always remained packed waiting by the door. It was more that that one day stretched into another and the rat-a-tat-tat became a familiar background noise. Can you imagine fifth graders that being part of your reality that gunfire becomes normal? Sometimes stores reopened and with one of their remaining neighbors, they bought a generator which gave enough energy to power the fridge. Ahmed helped his grandfather plant vegetables, squash, fava beans, potatoes, in the little garden in his grandfather's nursery that they had always filled with flowering pots. And if you're planting a garden, I mean, those take time to grow, so you must be thinking about staying, yes? They learned to collect water when the taps worked and to bring containers to the large metal water stations when they didn't. They even learned to play inside when it seemed too dangerous to go out. Ahmed inventing games for Jasmine, who was seven, and Nori, who was only three. At end of summer, he continued, I'd go back to school. It was the same school he had attended the year before, but it felt different with half the teachers and more than half the students gone. Some like Hassan had been killed, but most had fled to Turkey, Jordan or Lebanon. It took several weeks to figure out a new football team, what with the center having lost a leg, the left wing dead and the goalie and halfback in Turkey. War is a terrible thing, fifth graders. There were also days when it was too dangerous to walk the five blocks to school, so his father taught him and Jasmine at home. But on the days that he could go, Ahmed was happy to be there, if only because he imagined he was safe. But that feeling didn't last long. That spring, school is bombed. Thank God no one is there, but building is no more. After this, I stay home. Did you feel safe there, Max asked? Not during bombs. While it amazed Ahmed what a person could get used to, there was no getting used to the bombs. When they heard the vacuum cleaner sound of a government helicopter flying in overhead, they would run to the shelter in the basement of a large building nearby. If they heard a whizzing noise, however, even Nori knew there was not enough time and to instead run to the bathroom, the safest place in the house. Imagine she knows the sounds um, and knows there's not enough time and she's only three. They would all pile into the tub together, his mother and father on top of them, Ahmed's palms sweating and his breath short. At night, he had sickening dreams of bodies split in half. He found himself staring off into the distance more and more, forgetting what he was supposed to be doing. Nori started to wet the bed. One day, a bomb hit his grandfather's nursery. His grandfather, fortunately, was not there. He'd gone to help plant flowers at a traffic circle. 
but the nursery's destruction affected him almost as much as the death of Ahmed's grandmother had several years earlier. Think about that, fifth graders. Why would it affect him so much, do you think? My grandfather has heart problem and comes live with us. Mother not want him to want to leave him. She worry also what happened to him if we go. Every day the electricity came back on for about two hours and his mother was able to check her email. She read news of more roads north being closed and families stranded on the Syrian side of the border, sick from spoiled food, infested by lice and without toilets in the scorching heat. Better to die here, she said, together. Ahmed knew she didn't really mean this. Accepting death, looking it in the face, was just a way to be less afraid. In 2014, my father starts secret school for his students, underground in a cellar. Max looked around the cellar, like this? Yes. For the first time, Ahmed wondered if that was part of the cellar's appeal. And you went too? Um, think about it, fifth graders. They're in literally in a war zone, and they're still finding a way to learn. That's how important education is to their family. Think about that. Sometime I come, but most times my father say it is too dangerous for me to be out. Daesh, Islamic State, comes to Aleppo too. They want boys over 10 years to fight, not go to school. I help mother at home. Last winter is very hard, most cold winter in long time. So um, the rebels want, are trying to capture young boys and rec recruit or just take them to, to fight. So it would be dangerous for him to go to the school. The heat only worked a few hours a day. So all five of them had started sleeping in his parents' bed. Although Ahmed could see the clouds of his own breath, they kept warm this way. They kept warm this way. Outside on the streets, trash piled up, pipes burst, and the puddles froze. The bread lines grew longer, and people quarreled to protect their spots. His father sometimes had to close his school to buy bread, waiting up to 12 hours in the chilly rain. Fewer students were attending anyway. Every day they heard more stories of government planes bombing schools and hospitals, of rebels executing entire families they suspected of collaborating with the government, of Daesh killing civilians who didn't follow their strict religious rules. His father looked at their bags still packed by the door and wondered aloud if it was time to leave. But his mother wanted to wait till spring. People were living in flimsy tents in the Turkish refugee camps with no heat and very little food. And some reported it was even worse than being back, back home. At least here, we still have walls, his mother had said. His father couldn't argue with this. Ahmed's grandfather was sleeping more and more and none of them really seemed in any condition to travel. His father's probably depressed, right? Much sickness that winter, Ahmed explained. Nori became sick with a fever and a cough. Ahmed and Jasmine developed a strange peeling rash. His father suspected it was from the water, which he feared had become contaminated with sewage, but it seemed too dangerous to venture out to a doctor. After a few scary nights, Nori had recovered, but then Jasmine got the fever. Her cheeks flushed under her big dark eyes. She was the beauty of the family, but she was also easily frightened as if she knew how fragile anything beautiful really was. She didn't bother to try to hide her fear like he and Nori did, pushing it away till it came back in other forms and in bedwetting and nightmares. Jasmine trembled when the bombs fell, then burst into tears. She cried over the deaths of strangers. She fed stray cats, then sobbed when snipers used them for target practice. One March day, I begged my father to take me out with him to buy mechanic oil. This is for a car but we use it for stove so my mother can cook special Friday meal. My sister Jasmine's still getting better from sickness. She stays home with my mother, grandfather, and Nori. Oh, bad feeling. Jasmine's fever had bro broken, but she was weak. Nori, who enjoyed, te enjoyed tending to anyone who would let her, was feeding her pieces of old bread. Her mother was making tea on the cook stove with the last of their oil. That was how Ahmed had left them, 
Nori leaning over Jasmine, his mother crouched over the stove, his grandfather repotting an orchid with trembling fingers. That's the image, fifth graders, his grandfather tending an orchid as Ahmed is now in, in Brussels. He was certain they had said some words of goodbye as he left, but they were too ordinary to remember. His father walked in front of him, always staying a few steps ahead like a shield. Two boys were playing marbles under an archway. A burst of gunfire made Ahmed and his father start, but the boys kept playing. A hungry dog followed them for a while till his father shooted away. They passed the abandoned bus, its windows blown out, which had been wedged between two buildings as a buffer against bullets. Then they jogged quietly past a screen of white sheets hanging from laundry lines to hide anyone passing from snipers. We hear plane overhead and bomb falls very fast. I see gray cloud over my home. I start to run home. Baba shouts at me to stop, but I cannot stop. It hadn't even mattered that there was still a plane overhead. Ahmed raced down the empty street toward home. He could smell the acrid smoke, the dust. As he reached his block, it seemed to envelop him. The early spring sun vanished into haze. He stumbled into the crowd, cloud shouting their names, Mama, Jasmine, Nori, Grandfather. But before he could clamor onto the remains of the house, someone jumped down from the top of it and tackled him. It was a neighbor, an older man named Mr. Al Ghaffari. Ahmed had never liked him much. He'd once shouted at Ahmed for playing football under his window and frequently coughed and sat from years of smoking. But he held Ahmed with a surprising strength. Don't go up there, he grumbled in Ahmed's ear as he dragged him away. It was only then that Ahmed understood. Bomb hit them direct, Ahmed whispered to Max. Seconds later, his father had arrived, shouting. Mr. Al Ghaffari did not try to stop him from digging in the rubble. His father's wails confirmed what Ahmed already knew. They were. Ahmed closed his eyes, squeezed in the tears. It's okay, a voice said softly, you can cry. Ahmed opened his eyes and looked at Max. My father said they feel no pain, but how could he know? And then he collapsed against Max and sobbed like Jasmine would have. That is a powerful, powerful chapter, fifth graders, and so tragic. And I, I don't know what it's like to live through a war and to be under attack. Um, and I know that is a that is a great blessing. But I think that's that's enough for today. Um, so, reactions, thoughts, share them in the drive, and we'll pick up tomorrow. I miss you. Be well. All right. Bye, sweet kids. Peace.